p.m. on Friday December 3rd and I'm about to start Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. This is a book that's been on my TBR bucket list for a few years but uh, I've been intimidated by it because it's very dense, it's very thick. Dense books are very hard for me to get through because I have a very very terrible attention span. I also have a terrible memory. So I have this copy which I bought at a used bookshop the other day. It's a Signet Classic translated by David Magershack with a new introduction by Priscilla Mayer. I have my note taking stuff because I'm going to try and annotate it. There's just something about the smell of a used book that is just so satisfying. I think I'm going to start by reading the introduction first because I don't know anything about Tolstoy. I don't know anything about his writing style. I don't know anything about Russian history. I am truly going into this reading experience blind. In March 1873, Tolstoy began writing Anna Karenina as a novel of adultery in the European style and completed a rough draft in three months. In May 1874, though he felt it would hardly please others because it is too simple, he took the first part of the novel to Moscow to be printed. But the novel began to seem terribly disgusting and nasty to him. He stopped the printing in June and appeared to have abandoned it until the following November when the need for 10,000 rubles led him to agree to publish the novel serially in the Russian Herald. During the novel's evolution, Tolstoy seems to have identified with Anna's need for passionate love. Her stature grew as his sympathy increased. Toy Story I keep saying Toy Story. <laughs> Tolstoy's Anna is a complex, sympathetic adulteress with a moral sense. Tolstoy kind of divides women into three groups. So you have women of the temple, virgins, women of the household, wives, and women of the streets, courtesans. A thing that I also thought was really interesting was how many of the details in the novel are taken from his own life. Um, and so there's a whole section in there where, um, a whole paragraph where um, the writer of this introduction, Priscilla Mayer, talks about all of the similarities between his life and the book. So one thing I want to do while I'm reading this book is I definitely want to tab any time that a character is introduced. I feel like that's going to be helpful for me to remember who everybody is and to keep track of everybody. There's also some continuous discussion about yeah, Tolstoy's influence by the French. So um, here's something I, I highlighted. Tolstoy's views of the city and urban society was clearly influenced by his devotion to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Tolstoy examines the question of the meaning of life in order to consider the problem of adultery, returning to his beloved Rousseau for a basis. Um, and then the last bit that I thought was really interesting was Anna is caught in a web of social, family, moral, and religious conventions which she flouts but is unable to overcome, doomed by the inherent contradictions of her society and of adultery itself. Part one. Chapter one, let's go. It is 10.03 on December 3rd. Before I start diving into this though, I have to light a candle. We gotta get, we gotta get in the mood, you know? I have this candle that I bought when I went to New England and it smells like Christmas tree. All right. I recently got a Tempur-Pedic mattress with um, an adjustable bed frame and I'm kind of obsessed with it and it's perfect for reading. <laughs> okay. This is 
is distracting me. <laughs> I can't listen to this. We have to read in silence. Obolowski was a truthful man in his attitude to himself. He could not deceive himself into believing that he was sorry for his conduct. He was only sorry not to have been able to hide it from his wife better. But he felt the whole gravity of his position and he was sorry for his wife, his children, and himself. It was clear that he had never thought the matter out, but had only vaguely imagined that his wife had long since guessed that he was unfaithful to her and preferred not to see what was going on. It even seemed to him that worn out, old before her time, and plain as she was, and a kind though rather simple and in no way remarkable mother, she ought, in all fairness, to be indulgent, but it proved to be quite the opposite. Oh, it's terrible. Dear, oh dear, it's terrible. This guy is very dramatic and very extra, and um, he's actually kind of comical because, you know, he's aware that he did this to himself. Like, he's aware of the clownery of the situation. Like, he thought he could get away with this. She found out via a letter that divulged everything. He is in the predicament that he's in because of his own self. Um, and I just think it's really interesting that he thought that if he could just, you know, hide it better then he would have been able to get away with it and he wouldn't be in this situation. Um, but then he also has the audacity to say, well, you know, she's like plain, you know, she shouldn't be shocked that this is happening. Like, I, I don't know how to explain it other than the dialogue is a lot funnier than I was expecting it to be. I don't know if it's just this translation or what, but I was expecting the language to be more difficult to understand and it's pretty straightforward. I'm not struggling to understand what's going on. So that is great. So he's apologizing um, and he's weeping. He's clearly upset and she is not having it. Uh, I like this line that she said. She said, your tears are water. She really told him to go fuck himself. I love that for her. You never love me. You have no heart, no honor. I loathe you. I hate you. You're a stranger to me. Yes, a perfect stranger. I am now on chapter six. I have been introduced to Oblosky's like childhood friend, Levin. Um, he has come because he wants to propose to um, Oblosky's sister-in-law um, because he's been in love with her. But uh, I just read that um, as a student, he nearly fell in love with the eldest daughter, Dolly, who is Oblosky's um, wife. But she was soon married to Oblosky. Then he began falling in love with the second. He seemed to feel that he had to fall in love with one of the sisters, only he could not make up his mind which. <laughs> the characters in this book are very interesting. Like, they feel very humanized and... I like that about them. Um, I also love the banter between these two characters, Oblonsky and Levin. Like, you can definitely feel the connection and um, get a sense for how their friendship is. So, I like that. Um, I'm thinking, so my goal is to get to 33, which is the start of chapter 8, but I think I'm gonna read all the way through chapter 9, so that leaves me at page 36, and then I will call it a night, I think, because it is 11.26, so it is late, I need to get ready to go to bed, so, um, I will check in when I pick up the book again. bright in her presence. She was the smile that brightened everything around. He went down, trying not to look long at her, as though she were the sun, but he saw her as one sees the sun without looking. It's really beautiful. So I'm on page 41. We know that Levin is in love with Kitty, so he is at the ice rink where she is at, um, and he approached her and said something really awkward to her <laughs> and now there's like this weird awkwardness between them and it's so tragic because you know he cares for her so deeply but she doesn't feel the same towards him 
people say I'm just flirting with him, but I know that I don't love him. All the same, I enjoy being with him and he's so nice. She's friend zoning him. So I'm still trying to figure out what colors I want to use for certain things, but for right now, I've got orange, which are plot tabs, I guess, things that I feel like I need to remember. <laughs> Um, and then green is for characters, like whether it's a character introduction or something about a character that I'm definitely going to want to know later. Um, pink is for any sort of societal references about marriage or love, um, or, you know, someone says something about love or how they feel about someone. Um, and then yellow is for quotes. So, I have officially made it to page 100. Kitty rejected Levin because she's in love with, how do I say his name? <laughs> with our main dude, oh, uh, Vronsky. So she's in love with Vronsky. She decides to not accept Levin's proposal um, and she feels bad about it but she doesn't want to force herself to feel things for someone when, you know, she's more interested in someone else. Then Anna arrives via a train and we see an interaction between Anna and Vronsky um, and there's a bit of foreshadowing that happens. Then something that was really interesting is we see this sequence between Dolly and Anna. Dolly expresses all of her fears and frustrations and how heartbroken she is about her husband and what he has done to her and she's not sure if she can forgive him and Anna tells her you know how sorry her husband is because her husband is her brother, Anna's brother, um, and how you know she should forgive him and stuff and Dolly does and that's very interesting because I am now in the ball sequence. So Katie is all dolled up and beautiful, thinking she's gonna have this wonderful experience with Vronsky. And she notices that Anna and Vronsky are having some chemistry. She sees them kind of talking to each other intimately and noticing, you know, body language between the two of them. And now she's suspicious and obviously heartbroken because she realizes, oh my God, I probably made a mistake. You know, here's a guy who it's very obvious over the years has loved me and has cherished me. And, you know, she decided to turn that down for something of more um, spontaneity and passion, I guess. So she's realizing, you know, I done goofed. Um, and she's heartbroken about it because she's only 18 years old. She's a young girl. What's also heartbreaking for her is she understands why he's drawn to Anna because she's just radiant and beautiful and exudes this type of energy and this confidence. Um, and even when she's looking very simple, you know, she still radiates this, this beauty. And, you know, that's, that's soul crushing for her because she sort of, you know, she admires Anna, but yet Anna is the reason why she is unhappy. So yeah, it's really, really good. I can't believe I've already plowed through 100 pages of this book. Like, I feel like I'm just zooming through it. Um, this book is very engaging and I'm just really, really into it. Uh, last night I went to Target and I picked up some new tabs. So this morning I woke up and I changed all of the tabs in my book to these newer ones. Um, I also bought some other colored highlighters and highlighted a bit more in the book. So I am now in part two, um, page 139. So since my last check-in, um, Levin has resorted to essentially giving up on love, <laughs> which is really sad. 
He decided that from that day on, he would stop looking for any extraordinary happiness such as marriage, and that consequently he would no longer think little of what he possessed at present. So homeboy has just given up on love and doesn't think that it's for him. He could not imagine love for a woman outside of marriage. And then we get an insight into Anna's relationship with her husband and how sort of mundane it is. They just sort of go through the motions of life. Um, there isn't sort of like that passionate connection between them. Um, we also kind of get a look into Anna's thoughts about Vronsky. She had been telling herself again and again during the last two days, and indeed only a moment ago, that Vronsky was no more to her than any other hundreds of everlasting identical young men she came across everywhere, and that she would never allow herself even to think of him. She's trying to convince herself that, you know, yeah, we had a little bit of a connection, but, you know, He's just like all these other guys out there. There's nothing special. Like he's just like all the rest. Here's a quote that I really, really liked. And it was something that Vronsky said to Anna. Not one word, not one gesture of yours will I ever forget, nor can I ever forget. Ah, the tension is real. She has gone home and Vronsky ended up on the train with her. Um, and when she gets off the train, she is met by her husband, who we quickly learn is very possessive. Um, and he immediately senses that there's something going on between the two of them, like some sort of vibe, and he's not down for it. What a good thing I had half an hour to spare to meet you and was able to show you my devotion. So he is marking his territory, letting Vronsky know, hey, she's my lady, back off. So I'm curious to see, you know, when their affair happens, which obviously we know it's inevitable. <laughs> Um, how long they're going to be able to keep it a secret from him because I feel like he is very like aware. He has this hyper awareness. Like they haven't even done anything and like he's already like, you know what I mean? Sizing Bronski up, trying to see what's up. And then I found this interesting passage about Bronski's feelings towards um, marriage and relationships. In his Petersburg, world, all people were divided into two absolutely distinct and diametrically opposite sorts. One, the lower sort, vulgar, stupid, and above all ridiculous people who believe that a husband should live only with the woman he has married, that young girls should be chaste, women modest, men brave, self-control, and steadfast, that one should bring up one's children, earn one's living, and pay one's debts, and all sorts of other nonsense like that. They were the old fashioned and ridiculous people. But there was another sort of people, the real people to which all his set belonged, in which the main thing was to be elegant, handsome, generous, daring, gay, giving oneself up unblushingly to every passion and laughing at everything else. I feel like this guy is really quite into himself and thinks that he can kind of do whatever it is that he wants to do. So I think he has definitely, you know, put it in his brain that he's going to do something about his feelings towards Anna. Um, and I, you know, throughout kind of reading his perspective, it's very clear that he doesn't care that she has a husband. <laughs> he's gonna do uh, what he wants. Honestly, Loki, I'm more invested in their relationship than I am in Anna and Bronski. <laughs> I don't need to read five chapters about horses. <laughs>